so today I'll talk about how we sustain good performance under heavy workloads uh, and how we're using AI to help us out with that. So I'm Danny, I'm an engineer manager at Gary Forge. We'll talk about more that, about that in a second. So I guess nobody knows what Garrett is, right? So Garrett is a source code management tool. So you can think uh, GitLab or GitHub, but a bit different. Uh, if you've never used Garrett, I would urge you guys to try it out because the code reviews experience is much better than, than on GitHub. But anyway, that's not why we're here today. It's the fully one that is based on Git. Now, why am I saying the only one? Obviously, GitHub and GitLab also use Git, of course. Uh, however, when you're doing code reviews, like, I don't know, approving or commenting on, on those uh, PRs, uh, that information is actually stored externally in a, um, in a database, while in Garrett, everything is stored in the Git repo itself. So everything is, is in Git. Um, some of the main users and contributors are Google, Qualcomm, SAP, and Wikimedia. Uh, the Wikimedia Foundation. Um, now about us, uh, we're deeply committed to open source since our inception in 2009. Um, uh, we're some of the major contributors to, to Garrett worldwide, and we also help clients globally with their installations, which is why we come across some interesting Git problems uh, and why we started thinking about this. Uh, I also forgot to say that Garrett is used for projects like Android and Chrome and has been around since 2008, so it's really nothing new. Uh, it was actually being developed at the same time that GitHub was at the initially. So today I'll talk about what problem we're trying to solve, uh, some Git internal basics. I guess nobody here knows too much about Git internal, so that might be quite interesting. Uh, what's the current situation with Git uh, GC maintenance solutions? Uh, some of the common pitfalls with it and how we're using AI to help us out. So first of all, I want to start with two statements. Uh, first, that SCMs are the heart of any software company. So I think it's maybe it goes without saying, but something we don't think about, that if your SCM is not working, so if GitHub is not working or GitLab is not working, nobody's really working in, in your company, right? So it's quite crucial that these systems are up and running all the time. Uh, also, I also want to say that modern Git SCM systems are actually quite reliable. So it's not every day that GitHub isn't working or GitLab isn't working, right? However, they're not perfect. I'm sure we all remember some big outages, uh, like losing thousands of repositories overnight or 24 hour plus outages, uh, but hoping not to jinx it overall on the, on the whole, the, the quite reliable. What we've started to see really is that uh, some of the problems or most of the problems really are with the Git data itself. So Git data ballooning up, going out of, uh, going, getting too big, and uh, and then yeah, things start breaking up. So what's the impact when your SCM isn't working? So you're gonna have has any has anybody even noticed slow CI/CD uh, clones sometimes? So has, does anybody even look at this? Uh, sometimes you might not even notice it, but your the clo the time it takes to clone your repository can actually vary massively based on uh, how well maintained the repository is on the server side, right? So we always just assume that the git clone is how long it takes to clone it, but there's actually things on the server that you can do to improve those clone times massively. Uh, and I'll show that in a bit. Uh, you're gonna run into additional server uh, hardware costs, because obviously if stuff is not running as well as it should, stuff is gonna not gonna be optimized, you're gonna have to use more CPU, it's gonna be extra cost, so nobody wants that. Uh, and then your maintenance team, so your DevOps and your SREs are going to be like just wasting effort and time looking into these problems, right? And they're going to be firefighting and that's not fun for anybody. You don't, you don't really want to be doing that. Finally, if things get really bad, then developers might not be able to push code. Developers might not be able to pull, uh, fetch. Um, so yeah, just, just not a good position to be in. But let's see for a minute why, why is that? So first of all, I thought I'd get the Linux repo here just because we're at the Linux summit. Uh, has anybody ever looked at the size uh, of the Git history of the Linux re repo? Well, you've got the answer here. So that's 4.7 gigs, which is actually not a big repo by our standards, but it's not insignificant either. Uh, but almost 60% uh, of that is the history of the repository. That 3.2 is the, is the size of the .git folder in the Linux kernel, right? So that's actually quite interesting to me. However, size is really not the only thing. Uh, there's also the shape of your repository. So has anybody ever heard of Git Sizer? 
So that uh, is a tool created by GitHub, really cool tool, uh, that essentially gives you a state of the various dimensions of your repository, right? So there's a bunch of things to look at. So there's the size of the pack files, of your, of your working tree, of the index, LFS data, then anybody knows what Git LFS is? That's a whole different talk. Uh, but it could uh, start getting pretty big pretty quickly. There's also the number of refs, the number of pack files, the number of objects. So all of these are metrics that you need to keep in mind when you're looking at uh, the state of a, of a Git repo on the server, right? This is actually not too bad. There's nothing screaming at you. There's just a few asterisks. I've seen a lot of uh, question, uh, sorry, of exclamation marks and repeated lines. So <laughs> things can get pretty bad out there. Uh, then we've got the load on the SCM system. So whatever you're using, uh, AI is becoming a part of daily life, really. So you're going to have more AI bots reviewing, uh, reviewing your PR, suggesting for new code. So the load on your SCM is always, uh, always going to go up. Uh, also, hopefully your team is growing, your product is growing. So hopefully there's just more people uh, using your SCM system. And finally, well, the current maintenance solutions are just outdated uh, and out of sync by, by inherently, inherently by how they work. And I'll go into a bit more detail afterwards. But essentially, by the time Git maintenance operation, which is called Git GC, so if anybody knows about uh, Java garbage collection, there's the same thing for Git, which is called Git garbage collection. Essentially, by how it's, it's developed and how it works, inherently, by the time it finishes, is already out of date. So. This is because, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about this, but each new push may essentially makes the result of the previous cleanup cycle less and less effective. And also, force pushes are a disaster for, for Git performance. So when you're force pushing, th there's nothing essentially wrong with force pushing, but it does add extra load on the SM, SCM system, especially at clone time. You might not think about that. So, Let's talk for a bit about what goes on in a, in a Git server. I think this might be quite interesting for you guys. So first, let's talk about how a repository is structured. So the core of your repository are objects. There's four types of objects. You've got tags, you've got commits, you've got trees, and you've got blobs. Uh, and all of these are identified by the hash of their content. In fact, we refer to Git as a content addressable data store, which is pretty pointless. <laughs> it's pretty pointless to need to know what content you're addressing to address it. If you already know the content, why would you need to address it, right? That's why we have branches. And branches are essentially uh, a quick link, uh, a, a human readable, a human friendly name for some of this content, right? On the server, it looks a bit like this. So you've got your tags that point to commits. Your commits uh, could have parents, could have multiple parents. Um, for example, the result of a merge. Uh, they point to trees. You can think of trees essentially as the directory structure of your repository. And these trees could point to different trees, so a nested directory, for example, or blobs. Uh, so blobs are your files, okay? Each blob is essentially the file that you're referring to. Now, how does this look on disk? You've got two main formats. The first one is loose objects. So this is where each file represents an object that I was just talking about. And also, the name of the file is the hash of the content. It looks a bit like this. I don't know how many of you guys have ever looked inside the .git folder of, of your repo, but you're going to have these folders here, uh, like 0, 1, 13. That's the first two digits of your hash of, 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 the, of each object. And then if you go into those, in any of those folders, you're going to have, the, now this is a simple repo, there's only one, but you're going to have a bunch of files that are all named with this weird SHA ones. Now, these can be exp um, um, inspected. So if you do a git cut file minus t of any of these SHA ones, you're going to get the type. So this is a tree, for example. Uh, and then if you do a minus p, it's going to give you uh, the content of it. So if you, for in this case, this is a tree, so it tells us that in this directory there's this files with the, that are blobs, they could be trees uh, again, uh, and it gives us the SHA-1 of them, right? So if you wanted to see the content of those files, you could do a git cut file minus p of any of those hashes and you would see the content of it, all right? The other format is called pack files. So it's, it's a bit maybe counterintuitive, but it's much more efficient in Git to have everything stored in a single pack file than 
all over the place in, in different loose objects, right? Because Git is a graph, as we'll see in a second, and you need to traverse these objects, and if you need to also find the files that they're stored in, it just becomes extremely inefficient. So pack files store multiple objects, but these objects don't know who they are. It's essentially a big old list of bits and bytes, and they don't know who's who. So there's an index files associated to it, that uh, it looks a bit like this. So you've got your pack files there at the bottom, you've got your index files, and these tell us where each object starts and ends, okay? And we also see this bitmap file, which I'll talk at length uh, in a second. Now, just to give you some context on, uh, on naming conventions, so in the Git world, when someone uh, arrives and push to a server, it's actually pushing pack files directly. So each push adds new pack files on the server side. And these, um, a push is called the receive pack in the Git world because the Git server is receiving data. So it's seen from the server side, right? Now, Garrett, and now uh, here's why I'm specifying Garrett UIs in interactions create loose objects. Okay, while GitHub and GitLab UI interaction just write data to a database, so they, they, sorry, they don't really interact with, with the repo at all. Conversely to that, when a user comes along and does a fetch or a clone, that's called an upload pack, because the server is uploading data to the server. Now, this is where the magic happens. There's actually a lot going on here, so let's look at it in a bit more detail. The, this is a whole topic by itself, by the way. I gave a talk last week or two weeks ago about just just this, so um, I'm gonna shorten it a bit, and I'm only talking about the first two phases because it's what we care about. But essentially, say you've been on holiday and you come back and you want to get the latest data in, in your Git server. So your your client, you're the client, you're stuck on commit A, and you want to get the new uh, the new work that um, your colleagues have done while you were away. So you're gonna request the latest version of the branch. The server is going to reply telling you, this is the latest SHA-1 that I've got. The client says, great, I want that. This is what I have. Figure out what you need to give me so that I can reconstruct the graph to get to the SHA-1 that you've got the minute. Okay? So we introduce this concept of have and want. You might see that in a few messages. I don't know if you've ever noticed uh, want not valid uh, in your clones, but that's something that comes up, and this is where it comes from. Now. Once we've done that, the phase, have you guys ever seen when you do a clone, it comes up with counting objects? That's, that's what this is doing, okay? So the commit needs to, all the commits need to be traversed until we find the have commit, okay? So it literally goes through all of the commits. It then stops when it finds the have, and then it needs to traverse the remaining of the graph, okay? So each and every single object needs to be traversed. Now, this is quite simple here when I've got a stupid graph with like four commits and 12 objects, but um, obviously as soon as the repo becomes much bigger or even half decent size, this is gonna be pretty expensive and it actually takes a really long time. Um, clones are especially bad, uh, are especially bad because there's no halves. Like everything is a want. So when you're cloning, the client wants everything, right? So you need to traverse the full graph. So yeah, this just becomes worse and worse as time goes by because the repo becomes bigger. So this just becomes more and more inefficient. Now, introducing bitmaps. Now, this is nothing new. So obviously, these have been a problem since Git has been around. And uh, the, guy, the great folks at Google, actually, uh, introduced bitmaps in 2013, I believe it was. And uh, then Seagate and uh, GitHub uh, also implemented it and use it to this day. But essentially, what they are is the reachability index of each object. So it tells us from each object what other objects I can reach. We only care about the commit level, so it tells us from each commit, commit which other objects I can reach, okay? Uh, so yeah, it helps us understand what commits uh, I can reach, what objects I can reach from, from a given commit. The, you need two of them, obviously, because you need the have bitmap and you need the want bitmap, okay? Now, you might see that I haven't put the, I've put the bitmap on commit C and not commit D. Why is that? This, uh, this bitmaps are generated at GC time, or uh, garbage collection time, right? So they're not generated with each push that you're doing. They're only generated once every so often. So you start the GC, the latest commit at that point in time will end up receiving a bitmap, but everything that happens while the GC is running and after won't have this. So, if we do the set difference between the two bitmaps, so uh, C minus A, C and not A, 
it will give us um, the, the objects that, that we need to reach, that we need to send to the client, but we still need to traverse the newer, the newer commits, okay? And this only gets worse, again, as time goes by, because every new push makes them less effective and, and pushes the want one newer commit out, okay? So if, if you're not running GC for a, a lengthy amount of time, then you're gonna have a pretty lengthy new graph to navigate. However, bitmaps are extremely effective because in the case of Linux, you're only navigating the last hour or two rather than the last 30 years of worth of commits, right? So that's a pretty great save. However, force pushes are the demon because uh, they essentially invalidate these bitmaps and you can't really use them. And so you'll start noticing that the counting object phase maybe doesn't count that many objects, but when it then says search for use or searching for objects, that's, that's when it's having to navigate the whole tree and it takes a bunch of time and it's, it's just not good, okay? So this is why we're saying that traditional game maintenance isn't really enough anymore. We need to find, come up with a bit of a better solution. So, does anybody know what I mean by Git maintenance, what Git GC could be doing? No? So let's look at that in a bit of detail. So there's differences between JGit and CGit. Has anybody ever thought that there's different implementations of Git? No? So Git is essentially a protocol, nothing more. You can implement it in whatever language. I think there's a Rust implementation of Git that's, that's coming out now. So JGit is the one that we use at Gary. It's the one that's developed by Google. Um, we've been using it for many years. CGit is a uh, massive community behind it, GitHub uses it, um, so yeah, a great, some, a great product. Uh, generically speaking, they do a lot of the same things, although slightly different. So they compress the loose objects and the pack files into one single pack file. That's because even if you have multiple pack files, they can still, they still cannot uh, compress as much because they need to rely on the data within that commit. While if you put all of, this, all of the pack files in one single pack file, then you can get some big, big optimizations in terms of storage. Uh, we generate the bitmaps, as I just mentioned. We repack refs, that's an interesting one. Uh, we prune old pack files that are no longer needed. Uh, we create commit graph files that allow us to navigate the repo much, much more efficiently. And then there's a few ones that only CGit does that we don't yet support in JGit, but we might look to contribute, which is running geometric repacking, which I'll briefly mention in a second, uh, generating multi-pack uh, bitmaps indexes, which is pretty cool because so far, the bitmaps I've been talking about are specific to a single pack file and they can't really span multiple pack files, while the CGit guys with this great improvement managed to make it so that it can still go across multiple pack files, which is really cool. Um, and then finally, you can generate craft pack files, which is another nice implementation. So in a, in a bit of detail of a few of these ones, I'm not gonna talk about all of them. So garbage collection, so you, um, we're repacking refs, so we generate two pack files, there's the heads pack file and the bitmap, and then the non-heads pack file, the refs, but we repack refs, we prune uh, redundant or expired pack files, Prune and reachable. Anyway, what we're doing here is a lot of stuff. It's a big, complex operation. It takes a bunch of time. Uh, this can take hours. We've actually managed to create scenarios where this doesn't finish because it's like everything is so messed up. So it gives you really good benefits, but it's extremely expensive and, and takes a lot of time. Bitmap generation, which is an action that was impossible to execute before, but we can now, uh, essentially only generates the head pack file and the bitmap. So much more efficient, and in terms of speeding up your clones, gives you the same benefits. Geometric repacking also is a pretty cool one. So instead of repacking everything in a single pack file, you're only repacking the newer packs uh, so that you maintain a, a certain progression, geometric progression of number of objects in, in packs. So instead of always repacking everything, you're only repacking the newer pack files every so often. There is no, however, there's no separation between the heads and the non-head packs, and uh, the pack files are, exp are expired immediately, which could cause uh, some, uh, some issues when cloning. So for us, we didn't really think this was quite production ready. So now the question becomes, now that I've gone over a bit of an overview, now the question becomes, how do we get the best performance in the cheapest way at any point in time? And that's what we've been trying to solve, right? So, Talking about cheapest, you can simply leave a repo grow unsupervised. Now, this is not a made-up graph. This is like our tests. So if you start just pushing to a repo and do nothing on it, 
you would see how the clone times massively degrade over time. So you really don't want to be doing this. So the state of the art nowadays really is either time or threshold based GC schedules. Um, they look a bit like this. And you can see that during the working hour, the, the number of pack files goes up in a quadratic fashion. And then uh, after, after a certain time, <laughs> it all starts going down and uh, GitGC is, uh, is able to recover and uh, keep everything and put everything back in sync. However, yeah, we can't really, uh, what, what do we think is happening here? Well, essentially devs are just going home, right? And uh, they're done for the day, so they stop working and then Git is able to catch up, right? However, if you're a distributed team that works globally, you can't really rely and hope that your devs are gonna stop working and just go home and then you catch up, right? But let's talk for a second about why this is happening. Essentially, what I've already mentioned is Git takes, uh, Git GC will take 45 minutes in this case, so it wasn't too bad, and it's scheduled to run every two hours. So in those 45 minutes that it's running, and the remaining hour and 15 before we run it again, there's an accumulation of pack files that is greater than what we're managing to reduce at GC time, right? So we were lucky here that the GC was only lasting 45 minutes and it wasn't overlapping with newer running GCs, but really, if that GC started taking a few hours, we wouldn't know, we would kick off two GC at the same time and everything would blow up, right? This is not the only way of doing it, but it, it gives you a good, a good idea. So why do we think that a human can solve this problem? Well, essentially, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want a job where I'm just looking uh, at metrics and just like looking around and has someone force pushed? Has, has there been an, an increase in traffic and I need to run a quicker GC or anything like that? It also just doesn't scale, right? So I've been talking about one repo, but if you've got thousands of repositories and tens of different installations, this just doesn't scale, right? So we started looking at uh, how we can integrate some AI and make it a bit smarter. And what we came up with is a GHS. Anybody from England here? No, so a uh, bit of a play on word on the national health system. So we've called it the Gary Forge uh, Health Services. Um, so for this part, we collaborated with uh, Dr. Shane McIntosh from the University of Waterloo. Uh, he's done some great stuff. Uh, you can Google him up. Uh, he's he's helping, out, helping us out with the scientific background to this, and he's also going to be publishing um, uh, some, some papers on this. Uh, but the, um, we'll talk a bit about the AI solutions that we've implemented, which is called reinforcement learning. Uh, the basic concept here is that we've got an agent. This agent can take some actions. These actions impact an environment. We observe that environment to assess the actions that the agent took. And then we feed this back to the agent itself so that it can figure out if the action was a good action or a bad action, okay? In more concrete terms, your environment is gonna be the SCM system. Uh, we then have a microservice that's collecting metrics. Uh, the AI tool then does its job. And then we have another microservice that is gonna execute those actions, okay? Now, let's talk about a bit the actions that our model can take. Um, so it can do nothing. If the system is behaving well, then why, why bother? It can create bitmaps. It can repack refs. It can remove keep files. Uh, and finally, it, it could also run geometric repacking, uh, but we've, we've tried with it, and for the reasons I was saying earlier, we decided we weren't gonna really include it uh, long term, but I mean, it's pro we're probably gonna work towards being able to include it. Now, some of you might have figured out that we didn't include full GC as part of this. Uh, there's a few reasons for that. So first of all, it's a long lasting action, as I've mentioned. So if we kick it off now, we're not gonna, ha we're not gonna know if it was a successful or unsuccessful, and we we're not gonna know for like a few hours, right? So the model is gonna struggle to figure out if the action that it took two hours ago is gonna be directly related to an improvement that we're seeing now or something else happening in the system, right? Um, it also invalidate Git caches, which could be pretty catastrophic, uh, and we don't wanna be doing that in the middle of the day. Uh, and also could add unnecessary load. Say your machine is already struggling, you start running a Git GC, and then that's the kiss of death for it, and you, and you kill that machine, right? And we also don't have, uh, we're still not collecting system metrics, so we're not able to tell if, um, yeah, we're still not able to tell if that's gonna kill the machine or not. We plan to introduce that at a later iteration. So 
Now we talk a bit by op uh, observing the environment, but obviously first we need to look at what we're looking to optimize. So I don't know how many of you guys know, but there's a service that we offer called Garrett Hub, which is free. You can Google it and it's essentially a free Garrett uh, instance. And we looked at, uh, it, it, it's not small, it has 30,000 uh, users, I believe Red Hat, Red Hat are using it as well. So we started looking at what are the main operations that are executed. And we noticed that by far, by, yeah, by far upload pack is the main thing that's happening on our servers. Uh, and this is probably because of all the CI CD builds going on, uh, overtake uh, the amount of pushes that a customer will be doing, that, that a client will be doing. So we decided to optimize that. So um, we then decided to select a few metrics that help the agent make some decisions. Uh, we decided to select the BIMAP index misses and the number of loose objects and, and loose refs. So this should be able to tell us pretty quickly if we're not using the BIMAP um, as we should be or if the number of loose objects and refs is just like exploding too much. So we need to do something about it. Okay. Um, finally, how do we assess if, if that was uh, a good or a bad action to execute? So in equal part, we are assigning uh, some reward if uh, the index misses uh, metric improved. Uh, some reward if the search for a use time improves. This is the time Git spends searching for all of the objects. And if the BIMAP is effective, then it won't. Uh, and finally, we're going to give a reward although um, I'll talk about this in a second, based on the action cost, okay? So for index misses, obviously, if you go from a state that we've got no bitmap to a state that we have a bitmap, we're gonna give a, a reward that's proportional to the effectiveness of the bitmap, which is calculated by how many objects are we searching for to reuse. So if that metric goes down to or close to zero, then that's been an effective bitmap. Uh, if we already have a BIMAP and we generate a new one, there's going to be no reward if the rate degrades, there's going to be a medium reward or a small reward if the rate is unchanged, and there's going to be a full reward if the rate uh, improves. Finally, not that this is uh, a possible action because we haven't coded it into the agent, but you could go from a state where you've got a BIMAP to one state where you've got none, and so we generate no, no reward. Again, let's sit very similarly, let's look at the rewards for the search for use. If we go from a stay where it's a medium on a scale of how long it takes uh, to medium, then there's gonna be a small reward. High to medium is gonna give us a medium reward and from high to low is gonna give us a full reward. So this means that we've improved the state of the system uh, by a lot. Conversely, uh, rewarding for action cost. So if we've taken no action, we're gonna give a full reward because there's no cost to that. Uh, if we create a bitmap, it's not an expensive operation, but it's the most expensive operation that the agent can take at this point in time. So that's gonna give no reward. And then if we're repacking refs, that's gonna be a small reward. Uh, finally, uh, let's look at for a second at how we implemented the agent. So we used an algorithm called Q-Learning, which is a white box. There's no complicated neural networks or something that we don't know what's going on in the background. Uh, so what we need is essentially a discrete representation of the state, uh, past actions and uh, that were taken in that state, and a cumulative reward of the rewards that we get, uh, that, we, that we got for those actions, okay? So at this point, we need to select um, when we find ourselves in any state, we need to select an action to execute. So what we're doing is from action 521, for example, we're going to filter out the relevant entries, so the ones that are in, in a different state, and then we're going to select the one that got our, uh, the highest cumulative prior reward. So we're going to end up in this scenario with creating the bitmap. Okay, this is this is just an example. So. Yeah, that's re uh, quick reinforcement learning for you guys. So let's quickly look at the theoretical evaluation of the plan. So what we thought we were gonna see. So uh, we're gonna plot the search for use over time and we're gonna plot a few different scenarios. So if you've got no remedial action, the search for use grows as, as we were theorizing, well, as, as I showed earlier. Uh, this is something by the way that we theorized and then we went to figure out if it's actually happened or not. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, if we use time-based GC, we see that the system stays in play a bit longer, but eventually also can't cope. And then with our agent, what we were hoping to see is that 
we were always able to keep the search for use quite low. So the two KPIs that we gave ourselves is to minimize the area under the curve. So yeah, reduce the amount of area to a minimum and also the number of catastrophes that are happening uh, during the experiment. Now, how do we evaluate this in the real world? And I think for me, this is the most interesting bit. Uh, well, we generated a, a gym for GHS, so we called it the GHS gym. Uh, and essentially, we've put a Git server on steroids. So we did a bunch of modifications that you wouldn't really put in production, but allowed us to have to, to yeah to have much much higher traffic and, and uh, support it. Uh, does anybody here know Gatling? the load testing tool. So this is nothing new, but we generated, uh, well, we cre contributed many years ago now uh, an, an, an extension to it called Gatling Git. So that allows us to load test uh, Git servers. So that's what we reused for our experiment. So we generated some new profiles with our Gatling Git tool and started hammering this Git server. We then connected the, the, the agent to it that was executing, uh, executing actions and uh, getting rewards. Now, what this allowed us to do is we managed to, in a few hours, generate a few years worth of traffic and learn the, and teach the agent what to do in, uh, in those specific scenarios that you would see over a much longer period of time, usually, all right? So after that, so th we call this our warp speed environment. And then after that, we deployed now that the agent is all trained up and as a bit of a professional, we deployed it to production and now it's able to keep learning. So it's not like it's going to stop learning and learn nothing new, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be able to handle most of the situations and then see how those behave in the real world uh, environment and keep adjusting uh, over the years based on the newer data and the new assessments that it makes. Uh, so we call this, yeah, anyway, this is a normal speed. So let's look for a second at what it actually end up looking like. So this is the no GC experiment. We see that the area under the curve is actually pretty similar to what we saw in our theoretical example. Uh, when using Git GC, now we're doing it every five minutes. I know it's really aggressive, but it was a quicker environment and we did have um, things in place for which it made sense to run it much, much more quicker. And then finally, we saw that with the Franco, which is uh, the name that we gave to, to our model, uh, the area under the curve was really, really small. So this gave us a 64 22 time improvement over the baseline approach, which uh, not too bad if you ask me. Uh, so finally, to recap, uh, Git is uh, crucial to your team performance. Obviously, if your Git SCM is not working, nobody's going to be working. Uh, the server side maintenance can really have a big impact on how long your clone time uh, or how long your CI CD system and pipelines take. So maybe go and look if this is something that is affecting you guys. Uh, and then the yeah, time or threshold based Git GC is, is really, I mean, it does the job, but not that well. <laughs> and, and it can be improved. Uh, so to recap what, we, what GHS brings to the table, more importantly than the actions that I can take now, but it's a framework to train an AI agent who is able to, ex to execute actions based on what's best to do at that point in time, and it can iterate and improve over time. Um, it also has the ability to execute different test actions uh, with ease, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so you can add your custom action there if you want, and also you can then fine tune your model to your traffic, and if this hadn't been clear, uh, it works on any Git server. So it works. It can work on GitHub if you have an enterprise, uh, GitLab, and uh, Garrett. So yeah, that's it. Any questions? Take that for now. Thank you very much.